All right, so we're going to try to launch into World War II <laughs> again in about an hour. Um, so we're going to stick to, again, the highlights. Um, a lot of this is going to start off with where we left off in Europe last time, basically the rise of Hitler, the rise of the Nazi party in general in Germany. And uh, so we're going to take that as a starting point to explain exactly why World War II happens. Uh, so we're going to go through all these different steps and talk a lot about German foreign policy, what Hitler viewed the German place in the world as being, and uh, how he believed he would have to accomplish that. And that, of course, leads to the war, and we'll go through the details of the war fairly quickly to give you an idea of why certain battles fought in certain places and whatnot. Okay, so uh, name Chancellor in January of 1933 because there was a what we would think of in the United States as a congressional election in 1932 that the Nazi party largely gained a lot of seats in the House, in the Capitol building, in the legislature, called the Reichstag. So as leader of the party, that was one of the big winners of the election, he was brought into the executive branch of government and given a post. This post is called Chancellor. And from there on, he will start to consolidate centralized power under his own position and push Germany forward. Uh, just a couple weeks after Hitler's appointed chancellor, which is a military position, he is given a kind of civilian post at the head of the military. So it's like a public oversight position of the military. Just a couple weeks later, the Reichstag, the German parliamentary building, the building where the legislature meets, catches on fire. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories that this thing is actively bombed by some kind of anarchist group or some kind of anti-government group that wants to bring down the German government in a revolution. Uh, the biggest suspect is the German Communist Party that had tried to take control just after World War I ended. So Hitler goes to the German people and gives a famous speech where, or not to the people, but to the legislature. And he says, give me the power to conduct investigations to see who is responsible for setting the fire and tried to bring down the German government in a revolution. So he says, give me some power to run a kind of no-holds-barred investigation where they're going to arrest suspects on little evidence, interrogate people, and obviously with Hitler, you know, interrogation takes on a whole new kind of meaning, um, but to interrogate suspects and to figure out who is the core group that is leading this theoretical revolution against the government. So he asked for emergency powers to do this. And in a famous move a couple weeks later, the Reichstag, the German elected government passes a law called the Enabling Acts that gives the military and Hitler as the de facto leader, uh, the leader of the military, basically the powers of dictatorship, the power to suspend civil rights for any of the suspects that you know he and his people happen to turn toward as um, suspects in this so-called revolution. So Hitler accuses basically the communists in Germany of doing this, and he wants to go after them. And he doesn't want any legal restrictions, basically. He says, give me the power, I will break this revolution, I will destroy it. And the law that gives him the power is called the Enabling Acts. enables him to go off and do this stuff. And a lot of historians say in this way, uh, number one, the Nazi party was an increasing vote-getter. And the elected leaders of Germany are now voting to do this. So in a lot of ways, it is not so much Hitler taking over the government in these early steps, but it is popular support for his argument. And there was a rise of authoritarianism in Germany even before Hitler was appointed in 1933, going back into the late 20s. So this was a general kind of authoritarian movement a wave that Hitler rode. And it was a 
fairly popular movement in a lot of ways. So does this make sense so far? When, when did you become chancellor again? January. So this is just two months later. Yep, this is happening fast. So he's running his investigations, and they are brutal investigations. There are rumors of torture and whatnot, all kinds of you know, horrible, awful things. Uh, August of the next year, the sitting elected president of Germany dies. He was a fairly old guy. He dies, and German, uh, Hitler, as leader of the army, now takes the risk. Hitler now proclaims that there will not be a new president, there will not be a new presidential election. Hitler uses the army to take control of the government, basically, and abolishes the office of president and declares himself to be the leader of Germany. So now he has the legal authority to go off and arrest people on often just very little evidence of having done anything wrong. He has control and loyalty of the army, and now he is basically propelling himself into the leader of the executive branch of the government. That's literally what this term means, Führer, means leader. And from late 1934 going forward, Hitler will be the undisputed leader of Germany. And he creates a much more rigid dictatorship going forward. So uh, the popular freedoms in Germany start going away pretty consistently. He starts knocking them out one after another. Yes? Oh, yeah. Um, Hitler himself led a revolution against the government. Um, in Munich. And uh, that didn't succeed, so he was thrown in jail for you know, crimes against the state, basically. And while he was in jail, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, which translates to My Struggle, where all these ideas are clearly laid out. It shouldn't be much mystery. And that's another kind of political failure of the Germans and other Europeans, of not actually reading his political statement. Um, all this stuff against the Jews and the international conspiracy and um, the need to reunify the German people, that's all, it's all in there. It's, anyone who reads the book, it shouldn't be much of a mystery. Um, when was the time when they were making advertisements? Oh, that's in the 20s, but that'll go forward. Yeah. Uh, they don't stop doing advertisements. I mean. and does, he, does he do like some... Someone unconscious something to unconscious, subconscious advertising. I don't know. I haven't studied that level of it. I, I just don't have an answer. Yeah. I don't have the information to even answer that. Sorry. But yeah, uh, Hitler's government ramps up a propaganda machine that's very effective. So eventually, uh, the Nazi Party is the only legal party in Germany. If you're a member of the government, you are a Nazi by default. And if you have any kind of powerful position, like teacher, you will have to usually be a Nazi party member. So this Nazi party seeps down very deep into society. Not all the people that were theoretically in the Nazi party really wanted to be, but in order to keep their jobs, they often had to be. Yeah? Well, when I started in support, you know, you know, well, uh, there, there's a lot of different groups. Um, uh, Hitler is also going to run the national economy, so he has support from certain large businesses, German corporations, and he gives political favors to them. Uh, obviously the army is on his side because he promises to rebuild the army and make it powerful again, so the, the generals love that idea. Um, he has a lot of different groups in his kind of coalition. Uh, but the problem is once he really propels himself to this level of dictator, um, no one can pull away from him without dealing with the consequences. Uh, if you start voicing your opposition to his ideas, you can be dealt with in a pretty violent and miserable way. And this becomes a rigid dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah, and they are largely purged from the army because Hitler, and as his ideas start to spread through the kind of advertiser, the German nation, 
a lot of Germans just don't trust Jews in important places in government because of the conspiracy theory. Or sometimes they just push them out and they fire them, tell them to go get another job. Um, the Holocaust is the last step in... Uh, at first, Hitler wanted to um, dispossess the Jews, which means take their property and their wealth. Uh, his next step, his government's next step, was to try to convince them to leave Germany, which many of them did. Um, and the last uh, step, what uh, the German high leadership called the final solution, was just the, the massacres, the murders. But that's the last extreme step during the war itself. Throughout the 1930s, it's largely trying to convince them to leave or uh, just take their power from them. If they stay in Germany, they're just mostly going to be you know, average workers or poor people. Yeah. When did the SS come about? Uh, the SS has its beginnings in Hitler and the Nazi Party's personal bodyguard mm -hmm. called the Brown Shirts. And these guys were uh, pretty much violent hired thugs uh, that would beat people up and attack anyone who publicly disagreed with Hitler and, and the party's ideas. Uh, when Hitler gets into this level of power, he creates a special part of the army that were supposed to be like his, his best troops, his most loyal troops. And he usually takes you know, his, his loyal bodyguards and puts them into that position. So they're largely kind of taken out of just like this private employment as a personal bodyguard and then just brought into the army wholesale and made these special forces, basically. The most loyal, the most dedicated troops under his personal command. Yeah. And they are the most fanatical and usually the most violent. And these are the guys who fight to the death, even when, even when it's clear that the war is going to be lost. They, they don't want to surrender, eventually. Um, other questions? Nope. Okay. So, what does Hitler think? Um, his political theories, and we've talked about them already before, for the most part, um, his political theories and his racist theories they all start to really merge together to create his view of German foreign policy. So the ideas we've already talked about, he talks about the German nation um, in racial competition with other world peoples. And not just Europeans in competition with Indians or Africans or something like that. Um, but he also says that the most powerful countries are in Europe and the United States. Uh, so there's also a European kind of competition amongst European peoples. And of course he defines the Germans as the best and the blonde haired blue eyed Germans as the, the super best. Um, but he, his idea is that if Germany is in this kind of racial competition against other countries, other nations like the British or the French or the Americans or something like that, he says that the, all the Germans have to be brought back together in one Germany so they can all fight on the same side. They have to be unified to defend themselves against military or political attack by other nations. So he quickly talks about the German people being the best, and of course that's a real popular thing amongst the Germans, just like your American politicians keep saying the American people and the American workers are best and most efficient. You know, Americans tend to like hearing that about themselves. Uh, so Hitler's idea of racial superiority continues and gets obviously a lot more extreme than what we have today hopefully. Um, and he starts making the argument that because the German people are superior, especially to Eastern European nations or races, that Germany should have the right to move into other areas that are fairly unpopulated, farmland, countryside type places. Because if the Germans are best, they should have a lot of land so that you know, Germans can grow their population. And with this whole racist theory, he, he literally thinks he's saving humanity from getting worse and worse and worse. What in the 1800s they called degeneration. De-evolution. We we're going kind of slowly back down to the caveman days kind of thing. Uh, so Hitler very much believed that this racial theory not only was it correct, but it was necessary for the survival of the human race that if you continue allowing all the races to mix together, that that would destroy like the, the bloodline and all the ancestral inherited things. 
So he says, bring the best race together, bring the Germans together, only let them populate with themselves, grow their population, and they will save the world. So, pretty extreme stuff. But in a time where people didn't really understand DNA inheritance, people understood natural selection and evolution and the fact that, you know, I'm a tall, skinny person, so if I marry another tall, skinny person and have kids, we're probably going to have tall, skinny kids or kids that will grow up to be t tall, skinny people, right? People had understood that there's that kind of inheritance, but they couldn't really explain it. So they understand that this kind of inheritance or evolution happens. They just didn't know the biological science behind it very well, the genetic sciences. And in the 1930s is when you're first starting to get those kinds of ideas that eventually will lead to the DNA breakthroughs but that's into the future. So this is a kind of confused area about you know, how much of this truth, how much of this, what Hitler is saying is scientific fact and how much of it is fiction. This is a, a kind of gray area or gray era in time where people don't really know the stark differences. So uh, he says that the German people have to expand, of course, that often means conquering other countries, and he says that the number one duty that an individual German person has is not to their family, not to their friends, but to the German government. Because the German government is the defender of the German nation, the greatest nation in the world. So a person, an individual German's greatest loyalty should lie with the government. They should be willing to sacrifice themselves for the survival of the nation. And of course, because Hitler is in control of the government, that becomes personified in the loyalty to Hitler personally. And if anyone rose up in German society and criticized Hitler, Hitler often wouldn't even have to send his own thugs out to take that person down. Other mobs would rise and take that person out, right? Okay, so this creates his view of foreign policy eventually. Yeah, question? No? Okay. Questions about this at all? Yeah? Didn't he actually try to breed pure, like, uh, uh, blonde hair, blue eyed Germans and make oh, yeah. them dumber? Oh, uh, I don't know about dumber, but he definitely tried to make sure that if you have blonde hair and blue eyes, it's so called great Aryan race, that you only marry another one of those types of people that have children. And they start passing laws to prevent Aryans from marrying other people or other people from marrying Aryans. Yeah. So, they, so they had no idea back then that it's actually better for you know, your genetics to actually mix with other people. That theory is probably out there. I'd have, that's a really good question. I don't know where the dividing line when that type of theory is proposed. I'd have to look that one up and find out you know, what year and how, how far the idea is spread and all that. That's, that's a complex question, and I just don't have an answer for it. Um, why did he pick out the blonde hair and blue eyes? Probably because it's rare. Yeah, it's lighter, and in a lot of racist mind, you know, the darker you get in your features or skin complexion or something, the, the worse off you are. The closer to animals or some you know, BS like that. But um, probably fed into his whole ideology on the the lightness of skin and whatnot. Question? So yeah. Uh, didn't he have like a right hand man named like Himmler or something like that? Yep. Hindler is uh, one of the more loyal ones. And it's very interesting because, you know, people like Hitler are short, they have dark hair and dark eyes. Um, Hitler is half Austrian, so he's not even a pure German himself. Uh, Hindler is a very, uh, not a very short guy, but he's a short guy. Um, you could say he's a little overweight. He's, he's not the kind of big muscular kind of guys that, you know, this theory worships, right? Um, so there's a lot of psychological studies on Hitler. You know, why would he pick out someone that looks the exact opposite of him as the kind of greatest ever? What does that imply? Well, Hitler didn't have blue eyes, on not he? Had like dark hair, but blue eyes. No, I believe he had dark brown eyes. I've seen pictures of him, like color pictures. He had blue eyes, or like dark blue. Not that I recall. I I'd have to look at video or something. Uh, Wasn't he like Bavarian? Don't they usually look like that in that part of Germany? Well, he's half Bavarian, but half Austrian. He's his mother's side, I believe, came from Austria. His father's side came from Bavaria. But, you know, either way, he's not a purebred German. There's a picture up here somewhere, right? Yeah, it's light eyes, right? 
know. Yeah. Either way, he probably wasn't very happy about the brown hair. And tell him, looking at the mirror, saying, "Man, I hate this brown hair." I don't know. Uh, but obviously, he wasn't. Regardless of the eyes, he he wasn't in a lot of ways what he said was best. So there, yeah, there's a, a lot of psycho- psychological stuff out there about why would he choose this? What does that say about his own internal psychology? Um, but we'll leave that to the psychologists. We're interested more in foreign policy and the creation of the war. Um, very quickly, after he takes control of the government, remember, the foreign president dies in August 34. Hitler's now in control. Very quickly, 1935 announces the rebuilding of the German military beyond the limits imposed on it in the 1920s by the United States and by the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I. He says, we're trashing those ideas. We are the great German nation. We're not going to sit around with just a half million manned army. We're going to build and build and build. And that was one of the big pieces of his economic program. Take all these guys who are unemployed, hit by the Great Depression, need money to feed their families, put them in the army. Two birds with one stone. We get more employment, we get a stronger army. What a great solution. Um, 1936, so moving quickly ahead, he sends this larger army into the Rhineland, which was cut off from Germany, demanded by France in the Versailles Treaty. This was not a part of Germany anymore. This was a buffer zone between France and Germany that France demanded to have like a lot of open ground out there so that if the Germans ever decide to invade France first, they have to go through this big kind of open territory and that would give the French enough of a warning that the French could mobilize their own army and defend themselves. So 1936, he reoccupies the Rhineland. And in his diary and in internal discussions, we now know that this was, he felt, the biggest risk. We now know that if the British and French had demanded he withdraw or started mobilizing their armies to kick him out, he planned on pulling the German troops back out into Germany. At this hint of any provocation or any... Uh, movement by his Western enemies, he was ready to retreat. But that demand never came. Why? Why did they do anything? Because, number one, the British and French armies are small, and the German army is already uh, getting close to their size. And uh, a, a general theory is this was a part of historical Germany. These are German speaking peoples. This is not worth fighting a war over. Why not allow him to bring German people back into the German government? So he was breaking uh, the treaty pretty much. Yes, right? absolutely. But weren't there repercussions that you wasn't um, by him doing that? The U.S. was going to go in there and... The United States people do not care about this stuff. Okay. They are dealing with the Great Depression. This is 1936. The American people could largely care less, or could not care less. They have their own internal problems they're dealing with. And a lot of Americans say, who cares about Europe? They're going to start another war, let them go at it. What's that have to do with us? And the British and French just didn't feel strong enough to stand up and resist Hitler's uh, growth. Okay, 1936. Uh, Hitler's great fear is almost always that the Soviet Union is going to attack in the East and that Germany would be forced to fight another two-front war just like World War I. So he signs an anti-communist agreement basically with Japan because Japan is the rising power on the Soviet East in the Pacific Ocean. So this is largely, um, you know, Hitler and the Japanese don't really agree with each other on very much, but they agree on their mistrust of the Soviet Union and their fear of the Soviet army trying to intervene to stop them. Japan in 1931 invaded northern China, so Japan is also conquering large pieces of the Pacific. And they are also afraid that the Soviets will rise up and start another war to stop them. So these two countries on both sides of Asia decide to form an alliance so that if the Soviet Union gets involved against either one, you know, the other will come in and help fight a war against the Soviets. So they create, in their mind, a two-front war against the Soviet Union, which theoretically would motivate the Soviets to butt out. Does that make sense? 
Okay. And that's the name of the treaty. 1937. Hitler announces that the official German policy is the reunification of all German peoples. And to conquer that so-called living space out in the eastern frontier, the eastern countryside, which starts getting very close to Poland. So he's not just looking at the Rhineland. He's looking to any area in Europe that speaks German or has German culture, he wants back into Germany. And there's a whole lot of them because Germany had lost a lot of territory after the First World War. So this is a big, big announcement. Hitler is feeling stronger and more confident. And one by one, piece by piece, he's going to start bringing a bunch of these little chunks back into Germany. And he's going to demand that the British and French accept it. And uh, the British and French largely do not seem to feel strong enough militarily to stop Hitler from doing a lot of these things. So Hitler starts making one demand after another. You know, in, in February, he'll demand one little piece of Germany. And the British and French will say, no way. And he says, oh, I'll move my army in. You want to start World War II? And the British and French will say, okay, you can have that little piece as long as that's the last piece you demand. <laughs> then a couple months later, I want this other little piece. And the negotiation starts again. The threats go back and forth, but the British and French give in. This uh, is generally led by the British Prime Minister at the time named Chamberlain. And he calls this the policy of appeasement. If you give Hitler these little pieces that he wants, then he'll stop. But it doesn't really work because Hitler being Hitler, he always wants more. He wants to reunify the German nation. And Chamberlain largely admits that the Versailles Treaty was one-sided and was uh, really a bad treaty for the Germans. So th there's a political argument to be made here that's fairly justifiable, that you know, the German people should live in Germany, they shouldn't be split up in all these different countries. But a lot of it is really the military weakness, or the perceived military weakness by British and French leaders. They feel that if they go to war against Germany, they're going to lose. They're going to get crushed. So over and over again, Hitler makes the promise, if I get this one little piece, that's it, I'm done, I don't want any more. Then he comes back a few months later and makes another demand. And this goes back and forth for a while. Um, the biggest conference where literally Chamberlain and Hitler met face to face and made a deal happens at Munich, a German city. So the Munich conference is hugely famous in 1900s European history. Um, when Chamberlain gave in to Hitler's latest demand and Hitler makes promises, okay, that's all I want, I'm happy now, I just want to you know, lead the German people. Chamberlain flies back home to London and gives what may be one of the most naive political speeches ever. He says, Hitler's a trustworthy guy and through these deals we will have, quote, peace in our time. Which obviously doesn't happen. I mean, they're at war just two years later. So that's Chamberlain, and there's you know, Chamberlain has since become uh, the victim of a whole lot of just popular jokes in British society. Okay, moving on. All right. So... Um, Next thing he demands, uh, there's a political controversy within Austria, which is a foreign country. Lots of German speak speaking types of people in there. Uh, Hitler says that the best thing to end that internal controversy within Austria is to give power to the Nazi party in Austria. There are Austrian Nazis. So a deal is struck internally within Austria to give the Nazi party some power in the Austrian government. That party immediately votes to invite the German military into Austria to basically take over the country. So Hitler marches the German army in and literally annexes or takes in Austria, makes it a part of Germany. Um, this is called the Anschluss. So 
So Germany has grown now to include Austria. And the next demand he makes, later in 38, is a small piece on the German border called the Sudetenland, which was really a kind of series of mountains and whatnot that's a, a good strong point for defensive warfare. So he's really afraid of being attacked and he wants a good land to fight on. And he says, again, there's a bunch of German people living there, so we have to bring it in. And uh, he tells the British and French leaders if they don't give in to the Sudetenland demands that he will invade and start the next world war. And he says that explicitly. And I'll show you a map if you're ready. Yes, no? What is Sudetenland? Sudetenland. It's a little chunk of The Sudetenland, here's Germany in, in, well, in stages, uh, taken in this blue part, the Rhineland. The Sudetenland are these two little pieces on the German border. You see where the arrows are pointing? It's just those two small little regions uh, between, uh, part of Czechoslovakia at that point. So at this point, he's taken over the Rhineland, he's taken over uh, some chunks down by Switzerland, he's taken over <laughs> Austria, now he's going after pieces of Czechoslovakia. So growing, growing very fast. And he gets the Sudetenland. And later he takes the rest of Czechoslovakia also. So one by one, all those powerful governments that were set up on the German border at the end of World War I to stop the Germans from doing this, one by one those other governments start giving in to it. So much like in Austria, uh, Hitler uses an internal controversy to promote the Nazi party in there and by doing that basically take over uh, the Czech government. Uh, he divides Czechoslovakia basically in half and sets up an internal Slovak government in the eastern part, this kind of orangish part, and uh, allows them to theoretically run themselves, but they largely just take orders from him. So it's seen as a puppet state, basically. And you know, at this point, he's taken in a, most of the German-speaking peoples of Central Europe going all the way down to the Italian border. And Italy, at this point, is under the control of Mussolini, another fascist leader. So he's like, Mussolini is like the Nazi party in Italy. He had been in power since 1922-23. So Italy and Germany sign international treaties to defend each other because they are the fascist military powers. There's a revolution in Spain that puts a fascist government in power also and they start <laughs> signing treaties with that also. So fascism is growing in Europe taking over more and more territory. And those new territories under these new governments decide to form alliances with each other for mutual protection. Um, the last thing that Hitler demands is the port of Danzig, which is up here in the yellow area, was given to Poland at the end of, well, Danzig is supposed to be in Poland, so not in this map so much. But Danzig is a part of Poland at this point. Um, Hitler says Germany needs a great world-class port um, on the Baltic Sea, so he wants to take Danzig back. He says it's not good to have Germany divided between this eastern part that's just above Poland, north of Poland, and then the rest of Germany to the west. So Hitler wants to take over Danzig in that kind of Polish corridor between the two chunks of Germany. And at this point, the British and French say, no, we've given in to all your other demands, you've done what you wanted. If you try to invade Poland and take Danzig, then the war is on. We're, we won't stand for this. And this is all happening in 1939. Yeah? Well, they take Poland in like a week. Yeah, eventually. Um, so Hitler is ramping up for the invasion of Poland in the summer, spring and summer of 1939. <coughs> the British and French are not giving in. Hitler is absolutely, completely paranoid that if a war starts against Britain and France, that the British and French would quickly sign the Soviet Union up to invade Germany from the east. And that is Hitler's nightmare scenario. 
that the Germans would have to fight another two-front war. So to stop that from happening, he signs a treaty with the Soviets. And this is shocking to the entire world because Hitler rose as an anti-communist crusader, right? He hated communism. He said it's basically anarchy. And all of his power in Germany was built up um, from the investigations into the German communists for trying to overthrow the German government. So this is hugely shocking. This is a lifetime anti-communist now signing a treaty with the world's biggest communist, Stalin, or the leader of the biggest communist um, economy, which was the Soviet Union. They call this the Nazi-Soviet Mutual Non-Aggression Treaty, which means exactly as it sounds. They agree to not fight each other. It's mutual, it's not aggressive. So they say, if Germany goes to war, then the Soviets will not attack Germany. If the Soviets go to war, then the Germans will not attack the Soviets. The secret provision of the treaty that is not announced is that the Germans are planning on invading Poland and the Soviets agree. The Soviets will invade westward, going into Poland and take over a lot of the territory they lost at the end of World War I. So the secret part of the treaty literally will cut Poland in half. The Germans will invade the western part and take over that, and the Russians or the Soviets will invade the eastern part and control the east. And that's exactly what happens. Um, that's probably a better map over here. Um, the invasion starts on September 1st, 1939. The Germans cross the border with Poland first. Britain and France immediately declare war, but they have not mobilized their army fast enough to defend Poland. Poland has a fairly small military, so they are, like you said, conquered in I think it's two weeks or something like that. And you know they were caught between two of the largest military powers in Europe. The Soviets invade like two days later. So the, the Polish government has really no ability to defend itself against these two huge military machines, and they're conquered pretty quickly. Yeah? What was the new type of warfare, or were they still using trench warfare? No, this is the opposite of trench warfare. The German military is absolutely obsessed with speed because they learned the lessons of trench warfare. If you get bogged down, it could last forever. So their tactic is to take... Uh, they built up a huge amount of tanks and planes, things that move fairly fast and hit real hard, so they put them all up on the border and they just send them over in massive waves. They called it the Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. So it's an all-out attack. So no men on foot or was it just pure tanks and everything? Well, there's some guys on foot, but it's largely what we call mechanized warfare. It's a war of machines, of trucks and planes. So they move fast and you know, they have a lot of explosives they can deliver. And that's how uh, the Germans really win the first major battles of the war. They hit harder and faster than their enemies. They're more mobile and they have more firepower. So at this point, the war is on. The British and French mobilize their armies. They prepare to attack. Um, Germany beats them to it, though. Hitler did a, another kind of series of events to defend his government. Instead of immediately attacking across the Rhine River into France because the French had rebuilt the Maginot Line, instead he attacks northward and takes out Denmark and Norway first and occupies those countries to make sure that the Allies would not attack through Denmark and just try to get to Berlin real fast and end the war. Hitler is always paranoid of a northern invasion. So Denmark and Norway are conquered and occupied and the Nazis will basically run those countries for quite a while also. Uh, after that's accomplished in the fall and going into the winter of 1940-41, uh, or 39 going into 40, in the spring of 1940, Hitler, just like the first Schlieffen plan, goes through Belgium again because the French again weren't smart enough to build their, all their guns to be able to turn left um, or turn north. He reinvades Belgium, conquers those areas, and this time he actually does get to Paris and takes out the French government. The French armies were in disarray. Um, They're knocked out pretty quickly. Hitler conquers Paris and conquers France. Did they have sufficient amount of money for the war to 
war were they borrowing? What? The French? Um, Germany. Oh yeah, Germany's been building up for this for years. And they uh, steal money from the people they conquered in Central Europe and especially Poland. They go into homes and they take uh, whatever gold and diamonds and you know all, anything of value they can get their hands on, valuable art. They sell all that stuff, and uh, that's how they largely raise money for their war. It's plunder. Okay. Um, so the Nazis take control over northern France. They take control over Paris. They allow the French to set up a theoretically independent government in a town called Vichy. And this becomes a famous town because these are basically French collaborators with the Nazis. So this term Vichy is now a, a hated term in French culture and French history um, because they're seen as the, the deal makers. They're the ones who followed orders from Germany. They're seen as sellouts, basically. Um, why does Hitler want to take control over northern France? Any ideas? The ocean. The ocean's there. And who's on the other side of the ocean? Britain. Britain, the next big enemy. And really the only country that Germany is still at war with. So German, the Germans go through and they start building up massive airports and uh, naval stations at wherever they can in northern France to launch the invasion of Britain, to try to knock Britain out of the war also, and win the war. Uh, the problem is that the British Navy is still the largest and most powerful on the planet, without doubt. Um, so it's not, the German Navy is still fairly small and much weaker than the British Navy. So Hitler knows right off the bat that uh, just sending the German Navy out to invade Britain is not going to work. Um, so he largely tries to rely on an air force invasion first to bomb the British into surrender. And the bombing is um, pretty extreme. And the British launch bombings against German cities also. So this is, uh, this is pretty awful stuff. This is where you get stories of the you know, British. They have when the, they're going to work one day and the air raid sirens go off, they go and hide in the sub, uh, subway stations to try to escape the bombs. I mean, entire cities and towns are wiped out in this. So, uh, the battle for Britain is largely taking place in the summer and fall of 1940, after the fall of France. And this is where uh, new British politicians rise that replace Chamberlain, a guy named Winston Churchill, and his famous quote is basically, the British will never give up. They fight to the death. They will never surrender to the Germans. Ever. And so he puts on the kind of brave, nationalistic, patriotic face and uh, convinces the British to continue fighting, even though this, it doesn't look good for the British at this point. Um, so the British withstand the kind of Air Force invasion for month after month. And uh, this is where Chamberlain says that uh, never in history have so many people like the entire British nation owed their entire national defense to so few soldiers, namely the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force. But in the long term, uh, the invasion of Britain fails. The British retain their independence and continue fighting the war. And there are atrocities back and forth between the British and the Germans. Um, they start bombing each other. It's just cities you know, where there's no real factories. They just try to kill as many civilians as possible to uh, anger the government and convince them to surrender or anger the population or something. Um, so Hitler is still absolutely paranoid that the Soviets are going to invade from the east. Uh, Hitler is a paranoid type of person. So he thinks that Stalin is going to stab him in the back, basically. And since Hitler is having trouble knocking the British out of the war, he thinks that um, the next best scenario is to invade the Soviet Union, destroy the Soviet government, take over all that land and all those resources, and then Britain will have no option to, but to surrender. So they start planning for the invasion of the Soviet Union, going through Poland, Eastern Europe. 
in the winter and spring of 1941. And the invasion begins in June. Hitler publicly calls this the War of Annihilation. He is attacking communism also. He's not just trying to knock out a possible enemy government, but he wants to eradicate communism from the planet. So he is not going to just attack Soviet military people or soldiers. He will send his troops into Soviet villages and towns to wipe out any communist sympathizers or any communists throughout all of Eastern Europe. So his anti-communism is a big, powerful part of this decision. And also his racism. He sees what he perceives to be a lot of weaker races out there in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, Jews, gypsies, other kinds of peoples, that he just think are too weak to be allowed to survive. So the war of annihilation is not just directed against the Soviet government, it's directed against the populations of what he thought were weaker peoples. And uh, the invasion that starts in June 1941 is, even today, the biggest military invasion in human history. These are the largest armies ever. And they are absolutely merciless. It's largely directed into three different areas. There is a northern prong that goes to take Leningrad, which was old St. Petersburg, Petrograd that we talked about earlier. Um, the former kind of cultural and symbolic center of Russian life, culture, society. They also direct a second invasion toward Moscow, the actual center of the Soviet government, to knock out the government capital and take over the whole country. And launches a third southern prong to try to get into the Caucasus Mountains region because there are a lot of oil fields in those areas. And you need oil to make gasoline because gasoline is the power behind trucks and tanks and planes. So it's a resource war also. And again, this is the largest invasion in human history. And you know he sends a huge amount of German troops in this and millions of German soldiers participate in this. Um, this is by far the most brutal fighting of the European war. The Soviet Union takes the overwhelming brunt of German hostility in the whole war, and there's not much doubt about that. This is um, a massive bloodbath for several years. This is indiscriminate killing, um, and the you know poor Eastern European peoples are caught in the middle of this. You know, when the Soviet army kind of comes through the area and demands, will you be a good staunch communist? Um, in order to avoid being murdered, you and your family say, yes, I will be a communist. And when the Germans leave the area, when the, Ger or when the Russians, the Soviets leave the area, the Germans come through and say, well, who took that promise to be a communist? And if they find out any evidence that you did, then they'll just kill you. They'll shoot you right there. There's no trial or anything like that. And this is mass atrocity. Millions of people are slaughtered. And especially directed against the Jews. And this is where you get the horrible stories. Um, Hitler and the Nazis created four specific army units that they called the Einsatzgruppe units. A, B, D, and C. Or A, B, C, and D, even. Who knew? Um, and their mission is to travel behind the front lines in what they thought of as enemy territory and wipe out the weak populations or anyone who resists. And they go through and they literally wipe out villages and families. Uh, this is mass industrialized murder. And they took what we think are fairly accurate records of it. I mean, the German people are really good engineers <laughs> and good record-keeping peoples for a, a long time, going far back into history. And uh, these commanders supposedly took very accurate records of how many people they killed in what places on what days. And when you add it all up, it's millions. Millions and millions of people. 
And these are people with families that are non-combatants in the war. They're not fighting. They're just trying to survive. So the, the mass amount of human atrocity is committed in these areas and often is overlooked in U.S. history classes. Okay, so that's what's going on in Europe into late 1941. Um, Japan is a whole other deal. Japan had launched the invasion against northern China, an area that they started calling Manchukuo, Manchuria. Uh, they invaded Korea. The Japanese are looking to expand their empire in the Pacific, their territory. So they start this one as early as 1931. So depending on where you are in the world, World War II starts at different times in different places. And really the thing that brought it, the war together was um, the fact that the Germans and the Japanese signed an alliance. I mean, this turns out to be really two different regional wars. And it's just these alliance systems that creates them into a large connected type of conflict. Um, so the Japanese go through, they invade northern China, they conquer Korea, they go down into uh, kind of eastern China and southern China and invade areas that we today call Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, uh, what was then a French colony that the French called Indochina, which you know, is a term that's gone away. Uh, the Japanese are conquering islands throughout the area. And remember, the Americans still have a possession on Guam and the Philippines. So that is official U.S. territory. And the Americans, through 1940, 1941, start sending messages to the Japanese, you better stop this. This is a threat to our territory in the Philippines especially. And if you refuse to stop, we will form an embargo to stop our companies from selling oil and other resources to Japanese businesses and the Japanese government. And that's a big economic threat because Japan does not have enough oil and natural resources to continue these wars. So by about the summer of 1941, we now know through researching the records, the Japanese government seems to have come down to a decision that they have two different choices. Number one, they give in to the American demands, stop their wars and even give back some territory. Because if they can't get enough gasoline, they can't continue fighting. Or number two, continue their wars of imperialism and go to war against the United States also and try to hit the United States so hard that the American public will refuse to get involved with Japan. They'll be afraid of the Japanese strength. Um, they obviously choose the latter and they start planning for some kind of strike against American forces somewhere. Um, there are rumors of it uh, going around the Pacific and even filtering around Washington, D.C. Most people assume that if the attack is going to happen, it's probably going to be the Philippines. But the Japanese are pretty audacious. Uh, they basically strip down a bunch of planes to be nothing but an engine and a gas can and a bomb. And uh, they put them on aircraft carriers and send them as far into the ocean as they can possibly travel. And they hit the American major naval base in Hawaii uh, at Pearl Harbor. So they hope that that will convince the Americans that the Japanese are too strong to fight against, that the Americans will refuse to go to war. And it has the exact opposite effect, right? The American public is led to be so outraged through propaganda that the American public immediately demands to go to war against Japan. So immediately, I think it's like one or two days later, uh, Congress... Uh, creates and passes a declaration of war against Japan, and the president signs it. So the United States is at war against Japan. Yeah? At that time, who has the strongest and largest army? The United States is far behind. The United States, went in 1941, had an army about the size of what Poland had. And they're still training with horses and donkeys. They are not a modern military force. They had disbanded their armies after World War I. But the U.S. declaration of war against Japan puts Hitler in a bind. Hitler does not care about what's happening in the Pacific. He has other fish to fry. So a strategic, rational thinker probably would have said to the Japanese, you started that one, you deal with it. But Hitler sees his own personal image and his honor rolled up in all this. So he has a choice to make. Does he let the Japanese fight on their own against the Americans? 
or does he honor his treaty with Japan and also declare war against the United States? Remember, the U.S. had not declared war against Germany yet. And in the end, Hitler decides to defend his own personal honor and the German nation's honor and all that kind of stuff, goes to war against the United States, declares war against the U.S. and the U.S. response. And again, through research in the archives, we now know that the Roosevelt administration, right off the bat, was more interested in defeating Germany than Japan. Viewed Germany as the greater threat to Europe, the world in general, and especially American interests than Japan was. So through Hitler's bungled foreign policy and his pretty idiotic attempt to invade the Soviet Union against the advice of every single general he had, Hitler brings the two-front war upon himself in 1941. The two major mistakes he made was invading the Soviets and declaring war against the U.S. unprovoked. Those were his decisions. And a lot of historians say, look, if Hitler had not done those things and just kept going against Britain, uh, he could have negotiated a peace with Britain, maybe kept a whole bunch of land in France and Central and Eastern Europe. You know, Germany could have been most of mainland Europe if he had stopped the war. He could have been probably one of the greatest foreign policy accomplishments in German history, at least since Bismarck. But he didn't. And that decision is going to cost him big time. Uh, the major problem of fighting against the Soviet Union, and especially the United States, is that those are basically countries in control of two different continents that have unthinkably large amounts of resources. I mean, if you just look at the map on the side here, uh, look, compare the size of Europe and much less Germany to the size of Northern Asia and North America, and that's what Hitler's going to start fighting against. You know, Canada goes into this war with the U.S. also against Germany. Hitler has declared war against seemingly infinite resource bases that he could not touch with his armies. He can't destroy those. He can't destroy their supply lines. His military reach is not that far. And once those two countries start bringing the weight of their industrial capacity and their huge populations against Germany, uh, they will crush Germany fairly quickly. And once the war is on against the United States, Churchill is known to have said, we win. It's just a matter of time. That's it. So questions about this at all? So why did he declare war? That's a good question. He's not a strategic thinker. At least not at this point. Yeah? But when, when he went into um, Russia, it wasn't just Germany. I mean, it was like Italy. Um, yeah, Romania. he had others on his side. but um, Legion from Spain and yeah, the Spanish largely don't fight in this war, though. They're the, theoretical the, the, allies. They, 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 uh, Francisco Franco sent them over. He sent a little bit, but not nearly as much as Spain had to fight with. Yeah, uh, they, they keep Hitler at an arm's length as much as possible, and it really pissed them off. Yeah, because they owed him. Francisco Franco yep. actually owed Hitler. Yeah, because uh, Hitler used German resources to help Francisco win the war in Spain, the civil war in Spain. Um, but after that war is over, and he's in charge of Spain, uh, he doesn't want to have much else to do with Hitler. He doesn't want to get involved in this catastrophe. And with Russia, too, though, wasn't it more like the winner that beat the Germans than the actual Russians? At Stalingrad, they, I mean, a lot of historians think that... Yeah, uh, most historians um, give battle, most, of the, most of the credit usually goes, in most historians' mind, to the Soviets for winning World War II. They take the overwhelming amount of German invasion violence, hostility. And it's an open question if the United States had an debate. I mean, that's a what-if question we can you know, go over forever. But a whole lot of historians say that the Soviets are the ones who really took the worst of it and won the war. And it's an extraordinarily brutal war. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of people killed in this stuff. This is uh, you know, worldwide insanity. You know, people were lucky, lucky to live through something like this. And a lot of Soviet soldiers at the end of the war couldn't even believe that they had lived because they watched so much death surround them. And um, the military policy, the, the idea for um, the West, Britain, Canada, the United States, 
Uh, there's a French resistance movement that builds up and builds like what the Germans call French terrorists, basically. Um, so there's a kind of internal French army that is operating against the Germans. They all will fight from the west, and the Soviets will fight from the east. And the basic military strategy is to just crush Germany between them. And it largely works. Uh, the United States takes a while to ramp up its factories to actually fight the war. And we'll talk more in detail about the kind of stats, the statistics of fighting the war uh, next time we talk about the kind of inside the American experience of the war. Uh, but the Americans uh, want to invade into northern France and liberate France, give it back to the French immediately. The British resist that because they said, well, we tried a lot of that stuff in World War I, didn't really work very well. Uh, so the Americans compromised and eventually invade North Africa first, which the Germans had also conquered, the Germans and Italians. Kick them out. They try to invade through southern Italy to get to Germany, get bogged down in the Alps, in the mountains in the middle of Italy. And the big battles are again happening, uh, like you pointed out, around a town called, or a big city called Stalingrad, down here in the south. Um, Stalin, because the town has his name, the city has his name, uh, took it as a point of honor and symbolism to never give up that city, never surrender it to the Germans. So the Battle of Stalingrad goes on and on and on for years. And it's an absolute bloodbath. Blood I mean, again, millions of troops are killed in this one place. Um, and eventually, the Germans, uh, Hitler refused to allow the Germans to surrender it for the same reason he wanted to take the symbolic value of taking Stalingrad. And eventually the Germans lose that battle and because uh, he wouldn't allow them to retreat, that army is eventually captured. So you have about 300,000 or so German troops that are captured and held prisoners, so taken out of the war. And from February 43, the Soviets slowly, methodically, but consistently push west and push the Germans eventually out of the Soviet Union and eventually out of what was Poland and eventually all the way back into old Germany itself. And again, this is you know, at great human cost. So that is their general policy. Keep pushing the Germans westward. So Stalingrad is seen as the turning point of the Eastern War. And that's its uh, long-term importance. And finally, the Americans, the British, and the Canadians uh, agree that in 1944, so we're skipping ahead pretty quickly, obviously, to invade northern France in an area known as Normandy, that coastline, and it been known as Normandy for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, that invasion begins the first week of June 1944 on what has become known as D-Day. And most of the invasions go very well. There are six different landing sites, or five different landing sites that are chosen out. And uh, basically, the, the Americans and British sent their navies into the channel and bombarded the German defenses in all five places. But one of them, they just didn't hit them very hard, and the maps weren't as accurate as they hoped. So the German defenses actually survived the bombardment. So on that one beachhead, uh, the invasion um, statistics are pretty horrible. And we're talking uh, 60,000 troops killed one day. This is the stuff you see, if you've seen that movie uh, Saving Private Ryan at the beginning, where people are just getting off the boat and just machine gunned immediately. And you're lucky to even make it out of the water and onto the beach. Um, that stuff uh, was, I believe it was the Omaha invasion. But the other four were much less bloody and much easier for the invading forces. And from there, they break out of the kind of beachhead that they created. They invade eastward, southward, and uh, a little bit west, but they drive toward Paris, and when they take Paris, uh, the Germans start to very quickly retreat back into Germany. The French are happy because they get their country back. They raise a French army. So at this point, I think you have um, three American armies in France, uh, one British, one Canadian, one French. So you have six different allied armies in France preparing for the invasion of Germany, and you have a whole bunch of Soviet troops in the east 
And uh, from the fall of 1944 going into the spring of 45, they invade Germany in the way they had not done at the end of World War I because Hitler refuses to surrender. Hitler gives out um, proclamations in Germany that any town uh, flying a white flag, the flag of surrender, out of any building in the town would bring bombing from the German Air Force. He told the German people, if you start to surrender, I will bomb my own people to force them to keep fighting. So Hitler has lost it. Um, there are assassination attempts against him um, as the German people start to realize that his plan for the world wasn't really working and he is actually inviting the devastation of Germany. And um, eventually the Allies, through many months of, again, bloody conflict, make it to Berlin and topple Hitler's government. The Soviets get to Berlin first. Hitler kills himself in what is it, somewhere around like April 28th or something like that. Um, he and his wife, he was married the day before to his longtime girlfriend, a German actress. Um, they kill themselves. Uh, they may even shoot their dog. Uh, they convince a lot of their high leaders, or tell their high leaders that, you know, go off and save yourself, get away. And a lot of those high leaders uh, refuse to surrender also and kill themselves and sometimes kill their own children with them. Gave their children cyanide. So these are people who do not give in. These are fanatical people. Um, so Hitler is out, and his high leadership is mostly eradicated, or they flee in the last week of April, and Germany surrenders on, I think it's May 1st, 1945. And that's the end of the war in Europe. So questions about that at all? And it's called Victory Over Europe, or VE Day, um, internationally. Um, the war against Japan, because the American administration decided that Germany was the bigger threat, they put the overwhelming amount of resources into the war in Europe. Uh, the war in the Pacific, it seems that the Roosevelt leadership declared that the Pacific was much less important, Japan is much less of a threat. Uh, so they really just try to keep Japan in a holding pattern. Don't let them take over any more islands. And uh, they form alliances, especially with Australia and the Australians raise a fairly large army to resist uh, Japanese attempts at invading further south to get closer to Australia. There's a big, big battle at Guadalcanal, um, which is seen as one of the big kind of defenses of Australia against the Japanese encroachment. But from that point on, really, the, the foreign policy strategy is to keep the Japanese where they are, don't let them conquer anymore, and slowly, island by island, knock them out. And you don't have to take every island, right? Take the most important ones or the ones you think that are most useful. Uh, you don't have to take every single one because you just, it's an island. What are they going to do? Try to run away? They can't, they got nowhere to run to. Um, there's a big battle, a naval battle out of Midway, where the American Navy basically eradicates most of the Japanese Navy. So from that point on, uh, the American Navy can travel almost anywhere in this area and pick and choose which islands it wants to attack. And if they don't attack a certain island that Japanese soldiers hold, they stay there, they don't have to fight. They might starve to death. So uh, they don't go after every single island. They call it the island hopping strategy. Um, two very important islands that the Americans wanted to take are called Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Because they are close enough to mainland Japan to build air bases on. And if you do that, you can run bombing raids against Japanese cities 24-7. And that's what the Americans do. So the two battles for those two islands, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, uh, the Japanese understood what the Americans were doing, so those are very heavily contested battles, and again, also turn into largely bloodbaths, where most of the Japanese soldiers on those islands do not surrender. They either fight to the death, or they kill themselves. When they run out of bullets, they will jump off of cliffs and whatnot. They will not be taken. Alive, at least. So those are two of the more horrible battles, or four of the more horrible battles um, of the Pacific. And the bombing raids start against Japan um, consistently after those islands are taken and really flatten almost every single Japanese city in you know, attacks against population centers and, again, mass murder. And then they hit Japan. Uh, Tokyo is just pretty much eradicated, even without 
the atomic bomb. The Japanese government said it still would not surrender. The Americans had developed the atomic bomb in July, by July of 1945, and they start to use it in early August. So they eradicate one city, Hiroshima, by a nuclear attack, and three days later they hit Nagasaki. And at that point, the Japanese em emperor demands that his government surrender because the Americans said, "We have, we have these bombs on the factory, on the assembly line. We've got more on the way. Uh, as long as you want to keep fighting the war, we'll just take out one city after another. It may kill every single Japanese person alive." So the emperor said, "That's it. Must surrender. That's o it's over." Japan didn't have those kind of bombs at the time. Japan? Yeah. Oh no. Japan still does not have nuclear weapons. Okay. It is illegal in Japan for the government to possess these weapons. Yeah. Or to, I believe, in their constitution, even house those weapons on Japanese soil. Yeah. yeah, so no other country has the atomic bomb. It's just the United States at this point. Okay, so questions about any of that so far? Yeah. Um, first one didn't convince him. There's a big debate amongst historians even now, and there was a big debate back then. Um, uh, why not just invite the Japanese military leadership and the emperor to like some isolated island somewhere and say, boom, look at the big bomb we have. Now there's no more island. It's just dust in the water. Um, you might want to consider surrendering before we start dropping these on cities. The American leadership decided not to do that. And it's very controversial about why they made that decision. There's a lot of different arguments. And one of the main ones is uh, they wanted to bomb a few cities to show the Soviets how much power the American army now has. As an example to the Soviets, uh, Soviets, don't mess with us. We are the new dominant power of the world. And that statement becomes very clear in the years after the war. So um, I just want to show you some images of what became of Hitler's so-called war of annihilation. So this is what Berlin looks like, the German capital, pretty built up. Um, lots of buildings. They had recovered largely from the Depression by the late 30s. Uh, street level. Buildings that are several stories high, people everywhere. That's what Berlin looks like at the end of the war. So his war of annihilation against, especially Eastern Europe, was visited heavily on Germany. And a lot of German cities look like this at the end and a lot of French cities and a lot of British cities. That's the German Reichstag, the Capitol building. Just absolutely annihilated. This is what the city of Tokyo looks like after fire bombing, incendiary bombing, intended to start fires in the city. That wasn't an accident, that was uh, kind of scientifically created. Uh, so you see this building here is only one, two, three, four, five stories. So it's not like we're looking down from space or anything like that. This is a close street level view and just not much is left. Uh, Tokyo again, um, right down to the ground. So these are uh, population centers. And millions of people live in these places at first, but not so much after the war. Tokyo again, right down to the dirt level. A uh, photo of Hiroshima from a plane before the atomic bombing and after. There you go. You can see uh, you know, streets, buildings, and then it's just all gone. Uh, this is what Hiroshima looked like on the ground level. Um, the trees didn't even survive. At the center of the atomic blast, it is estimated that that area becomes as hot as the center of the sun. Nothing is left. Things are eviscerated. People are turned to dust. Um, guy walking through the rubble who probably had some problems with cancer later on. Yeah? They're still dealing with radiation, aren't they? Um, Hiroshima is a population center again. So there's still people living there. It appears that uh, the survivors of the blast largely died of radiation and had problems with those kinds of diseases later on in life. But people still live there now. It's a large city again. Yeah. Um, again, Hiroshima, uh, right down to the ground level. So this was a war of annihilation and not just involving Germany. 
this war was probably one of the most brutal wars, wars in all human history. And I have a video to show you from an American leader, military leader who designed these bombings, had a hand in creating especially the bombings of Japan, that explains just how horrible this war became, especially for the Japanese. Okay, so from the quote, if you're paying attention, 50 to 90 percent of the civilian populations of 67 Japanese cities are wiped out. And this is a level of mass murder. And the planners knew it, but they continued. So this is not an interpretation often given in history classes, and I'd like to present another idea. <laughs> 